Conversations that matter. matter. You're listening to Tavis Smiley on KBLA Talk 15. We are here with Laura King, who, of course, is the daughter of Rodney King. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? I'm well. Yeah, welcome to KBLA. <laughs> welcome back, I should say. Right, right. Um, and, you know, thank you for talking with us on this important commemoration of the anniversary of the civil unrest. This is 30 years now. It must bring a lot of thoughts and feelings and, and memories forth for you. It does, honestly. It really does. It makes me know just how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and and what other things come up? I mean, memories of your father, thoughts about, you know, where we've been and where we're going. What other things come up for you? I often think about areas that are not, um, that haven't been reconstructed, that are still in the same situation, mm. but yet we're helping other countries. It kind of saddens me. Mm. Does it get, does it get, does it get easier? I, I know you never close on the death of a loved one, like you close on the death of a, like you close on a house or something. Right. Uh, and obviously your father fortunately didn't die from that D. Right. But died you know, many years later, which we, we can talk about while we have you here. But over the years, when you look back on this, because again, I know people are calling you annually, I'm sure, right. uh, yeah. on this anniversary. But does it ever get easier or are you finding it even more complicated to navigate every year? It's funny you say that. So yeah. it's like valleys. You yeah. know, some days you have good days and yeah. then you're fine. And then out of the blue, it's like um, unpredictable. Yeah. I want to say yes, but then uh, I want to say no. But age, you know, comes yeah. with wisdom. So yeah. you kind of develop thicker skin. But again, it actually doesn't get easier. Yeah. What, what, what do you make of the fact and how do you process, how do you feel about the reality that the thing, the thing that the world knows about your father is that beating? There's nothing else that we could. If you put a gun to people's heads, that's probably right. a bad metaphor. But if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you okay, if you were to, to to do man on the street, as we say in our business, take a microphone out right. and say, "Tell me something about Rodney King." Nobody knows anything about Rodney King except for the fact he took a beat down at right. the hands of LAPD. But you're his daughter, so how do you process that? That is the thing that the world knows about your daddy. You know, it's crazy. That and uh, the prolific statement that he made, can we get along? Can mm -hmm. we all get along? You know, people make that as a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and it is funny, but because we're asking the same question, we're still not getting along. Mm -hmm. Like, we're still in the same situation. We move forward, you know, but then again, there's another hashtag. So then we're back in the same spot. Um, I'd like to say, given everything that my dad went through, I think overall the way that he handled life was successful. Mm -hmm. You know, we all... We all can see the same picture and see something totally different. To my aspect, I think given um, the cards he was dealt, I think he handled life the best way he knew how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I I had the opportunity to interview your dad not long before yeah, he passed. Funny. Yeah, and it was it was really. Um, I'm jealous. <laughs> you interviewed Robin King. I did. Man, um, not too long before he passed, he had his book out. Yeah, and he came by in mm -hmm. person, and I got to meet him, and. May, I, I hope this isn't trespassing any boundary, but I would argue, Tavis, that he did die from that beating mm. because I feel like the burden that he carried, and we talked about it on the air, mm -hmm. for the rest of his life, right. the physical injury, the trauma, right. the way that he became yeah. like, like an absorbing um, entity for all of the pain and trauma that all of us suffered. I feel like that mm -hmm. beating kind of did kill him yeah i i would agree with you 85 percent um and i say that to say even though he didn't die physically a huge part of him died that night that mm -hmm. we never got back so i agree with you because he he pretty much suffered every day of his life until he expired yeah so when you say when you say 85 percent mm -hmm. um the other 15 is what him, yeah. like being spontaneous, yeah. um, he doesn't want to project his pain on the people around him. So mm -hmm. oftentimes I, I would know when he was in pain, but other people wouldn't. And he didn't want people to like be worried about him. Yeah. Um, so he tried to like, eh. but overall he was like in pain mentally, emotionally, physically, you name it. But when you say that you noticed something different about him after mm -hmm. that point, yeah. um, he was still here physically, but yeah. you know, something was missing. He wasn't the same dad. Mm -mm. Like, can you, can you? qualify that or quali what does that mean yeah oftentimes we don't realize the magnitude in which um permanent brain damage what comes with that and um everything you can think of you can be in mid-sentence 
and then like he blank out and you'd be like huh mm -hmm. i knew because i did research as i got older mm -hmm. but um i know that that pro as a man and as a black man and everything he went through i'm sure that was hard to deal with um trying to cope and have day-to-day -day conversations and you pretty much spaz out sometimes because mm -hmm. you forget what you're trying to say or you try to have a conversation with your kids and then you're trying to explain something and you stutter or whatever and then he was in physical pain 90 percent of the time so like he was always rubbing or hurt you know so it's like i think about those things and i know myself like i think i'm strong and then i'm thinking i couldn't relive something like that mm -hmm. let alone the day-to-day -day conversation that you know he had to deal with um repeating the things that was told him that night i, I couldn't imagine living through that mm -hmm. yeah I remember him describing the feeling of seeing uh, red lights. Oh, right. You know, in his rear view, anytime, yeah. or even just seeing the police following him, there were no lights. Just the yeah. dread and the trauma. Um, do you do you recall any conversations or any interactions around that? You know, it's crazy. So I tried to stay away from those conversations with my dad because mm -hmm. I wanted intimate moments because we never had intimate moments. So, for example. Um, a regular dinner never was a regular dinner. It, it was always what happened that night or what did you do with this? So anytime I had intimate moments, I try to like steer away from the conversation. Um, so it was hard because I can tell that he was in pain. So I would try to like change the conversation. So it was, it was, it was pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have, you have two sisters. I do. An older sister and a um, younger sister. Yeah, you are the, the, the middle child. Yeah. We ain't going to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the middle child. No, we're great. You know, we have experience, and then we have, you know. We no, have I can, I, I'm just teasing. I've got, I've got nine brothers and sisters, and oh, so wow. I know the middle children in my family. So I, anyway, um, yeah, they're, you're great. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Fearless. We'll, fearless. You're fearless. That's we'll right. leave it at that. Yeah. Smart. Um, smart. Yeah. So, so uh, how have your other two sisters navigated this during the last thirty years? Mm, um, you know, we're all human. Yeah. And we deal with life differently. Um, you know, we can all have the same parents. We can have, have the same different dads. All of us cope with things different. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard, especially for us because we went to public school. And we were never given the right help. We were never given the right mental help. We were mm -hmm. never... Counseling. Nothing, yeah. nothing. Yeah. So, um, you know, we all have our good and bad days. They don't do anything that I'm doing because it's not that you know it's not you, you're the spokesperson i am family, yeah and i've done it yeah. since i was younger you know I, I used to do things like this before my dad passed and he's the one that encouraged me to start a foundation because right. he's like don't spend your own money so mm -hmm. after he died i couldn't think of any way to glorify him like any way to bring him to humanize him as a black man and as a father and as a human being period and so that's one of the reasons why i started the foundation but um, yeah, they pretty much stay away. My older sister, she's done an interview with me, uh, I want to say 2017. Mm -hmm. But um, That's about it. Yeah, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not interested, yeah. which I respect it, you know. Our guest is uh, Laura King, the middle child <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of Rodney King. We'll continue our conversation with her on KBLA Talk 1580 when we come forward. <laughs> Can you imagine how many Rodney Kings or George Floyds are tomorrow, right? walking around here that looks like we're looking at them like oh they lost their mind what's going on but the fact that that happened to them and there's no videotape and no one said anything and 90 percent of the people probably never come back to be human again yeah. I, I i hear the point you made earlier laura about the celebration um when the very children uh, mm -hmm. specifically the other officers found guilty later on of course but in the first trial their children's found guilty i hear your point about celebration and yet it, it leads me to ask and so i will so 20, whatever the number is, 28, 29 years, 29 years. our age. Right? Yeah, you know, no, no, not your age. So it's, so it's, it's so we're, so we're, we're commemorating the 30th anniversary of the, of the, of the, of the uprisings, right. civil unrest, riots, whatever word people want to use. Um, but so it was 28 to 29 years from the time that your father, it may, have, it may have been 30, let's call it 30. Yeah. So 30 years from the time your father was beaten mm -hmm. by LAPD officers until the George Floyd situation. So about That's 30 right. years, roughly. Yep. Um, so how did you process that the four cops in your dad's beating mm -hmm. were acquitted and the four cops in the George Floyd beating were found guilty? Like, how did you, how did you process that complete dichotomy? I think there was a lot of suffering in between from it. Cause I was like, it just, I still have the same state of mind as mm -hmm. I did when I was eight during the trial. 
it didn't make sense to me it's like it's it's very obvious but obviously not obvious because they that wasn't the first judgment the, yeah. you know of course things had to burn down and people had to basically if some people would say make a fool of themselves to be heard it's like huh yeah. you mean to tell me like just for a human life like that's it's still to this day like mind-blowing for me yeah. at, at eight um you were eight mm -hmm, i was do you and if i'm getting too sensitive tell oh, me how bad that at at eight, um, that's a lot to look at. It's a lot to take in to watch your dad go through that at eight years of age. Do you think that you have been scarred in any way? And again, if it's too personal, you don't have to answer, but I want to ask, and that's whether or not you've had to get therapy yourself over these years to deal with this. You know what? I don't mind ever talking. I don't think anything's off limits because it's real life. Right. Um, and it's my life. Now, if it was like, if we were like putting on a show, then I'd be like, okay, but it's real life. And I think people can learn from pain. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, uh, it's something that you can never heal from. Right. And um, I've never had the proper therapy. I think I had therapy right when it happened for like a few months and that was it. But um, I don't think, even with therapy, I think it would help. Um, but I think like a Band-Aid, when you get the Band-Aid wet, it's going to come off mm -hmm. and you're still going to have the scar there. So no matter how much oil, some scars may just be permanent. And I think that it's something that's permanent because he's considered now a public figure mm -hmm. because that's a video that's shown nonstop. Um, it's something that I would never heal properly from. But again, I can use that pain to push me forward to help somebody else that's probably suffering from the same thing that didn't get publication of the world, you know, yeah. didn't get the proper recognition, you know, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. How do you... How do you approach that with your own kids? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my daughter, the great thing about the whole thing is my daughter didn't know who my dad was to the world until he passed. She just knew him as her relationship that she had as her grandfather. They do arts and crafts. That's together. cool, though. Yeah. That's that's cool. Man, yeah, that's, yeah. Out of everything in the world, that's the most thankful thing I'm thankful of because she's 15 now. And her first relationship with him was her grandfather. And they would lay on the floor and do arts and crafts. And she's an amazing artist. And I'm not just saying that as like a mom. Like, look at my daddy's artwork. <laughs> she's actually phenomenal. And um, given for him, like he gave her all her first things. So now I look back and I'm like, wow, she got to know him as her grandfather. And they.